Hey, what's up, Next Level Online? My name is Jason Covington. I'm here with my friends Monica and my man Dave. Listen, our service is going to start in a few moments. So go ahead, if you have not had opportunity to share and like this worship experience, please do so right now. Worship starts immediately following this. We're going to go right into our service. So get ready. Let's worship together.
and that cross didn't mean our life would be perfect. But we have hope. When trouble seas may rise, when darkness fills the skies, I will keep a grip on hope as I sail through the unknown. Clouds fill the atmosphere, waves swell with doubt and fear, but in the middle of the storm, you show me I am not alone.
God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this awesome opportunity to come together to worship your name, God. We thank you, God, for being that beacon of light for us, God, and for the world. We ask that you would help us to shine your light, not just here, but as we travel throughout daily lives, God. We love you, and we'll forever give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate Jesus, our hope, our light, our anchor, our foundation? Woo! Thank you so much for, for worshiping with us. You can have a, a seat. And my name is Scott. I am one of the, the pastors here on staff. And you know, I absolutely love uh, worship, that time of, of worship. These last couple weeks for, for me and our, our family have been a little bit crazy. Uh, school has, has started. My wife uh, went back to, to work after being at home the last several years with our, our two daughters. And so our last couple weeks have been filled with new rhythms, new routines running around to different appointments, sitting in carpool lines, pick up, drop off, all of that stuff. And one of the things that has really helped keep me centered, keep me sane, is, is putting on some worship music um, whenever I'm in the car, on the way to meetings, whatever that looks like, uh, queuing up that, that worship playlist on Spotify that I have. It just uh, helps me focus on Jesus, helps keep me uh, that right perspective in the midst of the stress and the, the craziness that the last couple weeks have brought for, for our family. And as much as I, I love the, the worshiping alone part, I love even more the, the corporate worship, where, where we as, as Jesus followers, as Christians, can gather together in, in the same mind, the same heart, the same spirit, sing the same song to, to our King, to our Lord, to our Savior. There's just something awesome about that coming in each and every week and being a part of that. There's some Sundays where maybe you can relate to this. It's like, I don't even want, I don't want it to end. Can we just keep going for the full hour? No offense to, to our lead pastor, Pastor Rob, who's an amazing preacher, right? But there are some times we're just like, hey, keep it going. Unfortunately, there's, we can't often do that on a Sunday morning. However, we've got an opportunity where we get to have that extended time of, of worship and prayer, and it's going to be at our A242 gathering coming up on Sunday, October 3rd, 6.30 p.m. here at Next Level. Um, and really, the, the name comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where it talks about how, how the Christians, how the Jesus followers gathered together to focus on Jesus, to, to worship, to pray, to celebrate, to just really just block out all the noise of, of life and focus in on who Jesus is and what he has done for them. And so that's what we're going to do that night. We're going to have an extended worship time. We're going to celebrate baptism um, and so much more. So I hope you can be a, a part of that. I want to invite you to, to make it a priority. Put it on your calendar now. Um, everyone is welcome. It's going to be here at Next Level. And uh, we've got child care for birth through five years old. Um, we just ask that you RSVP, register for that, so we just know how many child care people to, to have. You can scan the QR code that we've got on the screen or around the building, the seat in front of you. Just pull out your phone, camera app, scan that QR code, select uh, A242 child care registration, fill out the form, and you're all set. If you don't need child care or anything like that, you don't need to RSVP or register. Just show up. Just join us for, for that night. And maybe you've been wanting to take a next step in your relationship with Jesus. Maybe you want that next step to, to be baptism. You've given your life to Jesus. You're, you're all in on following him, and you want to go public with, with that decision. We'd love to celebrate that with you through baptism on that night. And so if you want to sign up for, to be baptized, or you just have questions about what that looks like, how to take that step, scan that same QR code, select the baptism sign up option, fill out the, the quick form, and someone from our staff will, will reach out, help you get uh, connected, help you take that step, answer any questions you may, that you may have. So be sure to, to take advantage of that. Well, this is your, your first time here at Next Level. I just want to say welcome. We are glad you're here. We're glad you chose to spend part of your Sunday with us. And I know stepping foot inside a church for the very first time can be a little bit overwhelming, a little intimidating. Maybe there's some anxiety or stress. There's a whole lot going on. You're trying to figure out where to go. Um, all these people are trying to talk to you. If you've got kids, you're trying to check them in. You finally take a seat and you can breathe a, a, a breath of relaxation. And then at the end of the service, you've got a decision to make. You've got to decide if you want to come back. You've got to figure out, hey, what did we think of the service? Did we like them? Were the people weird? Was that church weird? Do we ever want to see them again? We get all that. We want to help make that process, that decision, a little bit easier through our Stick for Three Challenge. When you sign up for the Stick for Three Challenge, all you're doing is committing to attend Next Level Church three times. That's it. Over the course of those three weeks, you're going to learn more about us, who we are, what we do. You're going to be in a better position to ultimately decide if this is the church for you. But if at the end of those three weeks, you decide that you don't like us, we're too weird, or whatever, we're, you, that's okay. We'll be a little bit hurt, but that's okay. We'd love for you to let us know. Uh, we'd love to help you find a church in our area that you can connect with. We ultimately want what's best 
for you. And so if you're here, it's your first time, and you want to commit to Stick for Three, all you have to do is head over to our guest services desk, which is by the entrance where you walked in. We've got a team of people there. Just let them know that you're signing up for Stick for Three. They'll get you all signed up, answer any questions that you may have. And as an added bonus to, to signing up, we'll make a donation to a local nonprofit in your honor as a way of giving back and as a way of saying thank you for signing up to Stick, Stick for Three. So make sure you head over to, to guest services. And if you've completed the Stick for Three, um, we'd love to know that as well. Head over to guest services, let our team know. They've got a gift for you. Uh, congratulations for sticking for all three. Um, and that's, once again, just a, as a thank you. So head over to the guest services desk and let our team know there. Well, a big part of, of who we are at Next Level is our commitment to make a difference. Every month we partner with a, a different organization, try to bring heaven to earth, to try to help advance God's kingdom here in the 757 and, and around the world. And this month we are partnering with Echo Family Care and through their diaper distributions. But rather than me tell you about who Echo is, what they do, and how we're partnering with them, we've invited Kelly Nichols, uh, who's on staff, one of the, the founders of Echo, to come join us. So could you help me welcome <laughs> Kelly to the stage? Kelly, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, we, well, we love partnering with, with Echo and what you guys are, are doing here in the 757. And those who've been around Next Level for a while know mm -hmm. a little bit about you guys, but um, many people might not be familiar with you and, and Echo. So can you share a little bit about who you are, what Echo is, who you guys, what, who you guys are, and, and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Kelly. My husband, Randall, and I have five kids. Um, our youngest two came to us through foster care and adoption, and then we run Echo Family Care Partners. Yeah. Um, we ser basically, we serve to support and stabilize vulnerable families impacted by foster care. The way that we easily kind of explain who, um, who that is, what that looks like, is um, stream analogy. You probably heard the quote, um, we have to stop pulling kids out of the water and figure out why they're falling in the first place. So what we do is we, foster care and adoption is pulling kids out of the water, right? But we have to go upstream and figure out why they're falling in. And for us, what we see is this is poverty, homelessness, um, women coming out of trafficking, domestic violence, addiction, incarceration. These are why families are fracturing, kids are falling in the water, and end up in foster care. Um, but we also can't ignore downstream. So these are kids that have slipped through the cracks and are aging out of the foster care system without a permanent family. This is especially important in Virginia because we do a really poor job of this. Um, in fact, Virginia is 50th out of 50 states on getting kids into a permanent home before they age out. Wow. And what we know statistically for these kids is 89% will wind up homeless, incarcerated, addicted, pregnant, trafficked, or dead within two years. And what happens is for these kids, when they have kids, they wind up right back at the top of the stream. Mm. And so it becomes a generational cycle. Yeah. And what we want to see is that no kids are aging out of foster care without a family, but that also no families are fracturing, that no kids are falling in the river in the first place. Yeah, such important work that you guys are, are doing. You. And you guys are doing a lot. We've partnered with you guys. Um, on various things yes. over the last couple of years, yes. and so we love doing that. But for this month specifically, we're helping with the diaper distribution that right. you guys ha are doing. So can you share a little bit more about, about what that is? Mm -hmm. How did you guys start it? Why did you guys start it? Yeah. And, and how it all works? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we pay attention to the requests we receive, um, and diapers were a consistent need. Yeah. And so what we realized from that was that one in three families actually struggles um, with diaper need. And in fact, when you ask women, they will say that m most will say that they actually are more concerned about having diapers than they are even about getting food for their family. Wow. Um, because for diapers, not having diapers means their children can't go to daycare. And if their kids can't go to daycare, they can't go to work. If they can't go to work, then they're not getting paid. Mm -hmm. And for these vulnerable families, it is a very quick jump. I mean, within a month, they can go from not getting paid to being homeless, and then they're at risk of fracture. Yeah. So diapers are helping cover that need. And we knew that it could be something that we easily resource, yeah. um, but we also knew if we were gonna commit to it, we wanted it to be a dependable resource that they could count on every month. So um, on average, we do about 12 to 21,000 diapers a month. That's a lot of diapers. Um, and the third week of every month. So we're super grateful for the church to be able to jump in and help cover that need. Yeah, that's awesome for you guys seeing that need and, and stepping in and trying to, to fill that for sure. Um, so what kind of impact are you seeing that the diaper distribution is having? What are some, some stories or, yeah, what kind of impact are you seeing that's yeah, having? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like we said, so so diapers feel, they're a resource, but they're a critical and absolutely necessary resource. Yeah. Um, and like I just said, um, 
putting diapers in the hand of a person doesn't feel like it's life-changing, but for many vulnerable families, it, having diapers that month can be the difference between having a job and having a home um, and having a family stay together and versus a family at Fracture. Um, but also, we as an organization would love to be invisible. We always love to have the church be the center of care. Um, so when families come to get diapers and we're able to say, hey, this is from Next Level Church. Next Level Church is supporting these diapers or whatever you guys jump into. Yeah. Um, we are able to consistently say, like, hey, the church sees you. The church hasn't forgotten you. The church is taking care of you. Um, and what we have seen is that for families that kind of come back every month, um, we started seeing some fall off and we're like, where where'd you guys go? What happens is they've leaned into the church. They've said, this church that I keep hearing about, I'm going to go and check it out. And then That's the awesome. church wraps around them and, and they've got a community. They don't, they don't need us anymore. They've got, you know, people and that is a win. That's what we want. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a be- yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a beautiful picture of what the church should look like and, right. and, and the impact that it, it should have. And so we're, I, I've said it countless times, we're excited to partner with you guys uh, with the diaper distribution. So how it works, where, where we come in mm-hmm. as, as a church is we love, you heard the number, twelve to 20,000 diapers each month. We love to provide all of that. And so <laughs> uh, we need diapers. So uh, order, bring in diapers, any size, any brand. As I learned earlier this morning when Kelly and I were talking that yeah. they can be open. So mm-hmm. if you're like me, we found a, a drawer in one of our dressers at home <laughs> full of diapers and our kids have been out of diapers for two years um, and they're opened and all that and Kelly's like, well, we'll take them. So yep. um, if you got those, um, bring them in as well. But yeah, mm-hmm. any any size, any brands, yeah. um, bring them in, put them in the, drop off in the collection crib that we have in our Make a Difference lobby. You, you pass it on, on your way mm-hmm. in um, or you can order them online, have them uh, shipped and delivered right to to next level. We'd love to have all of those diapers back by next Sunday, the September 18th, because the distribution is, is that Wednesday. So we'd love to have them all. And as another way you can, can jump in is um, Echo needs help uh, bundling yes. and uh, those diapers on Wednesday, the 21st. So you can scan the QR code, select diaper distribution to get more information on that if you want to volunteer and to, to sign up to help them bundle it all up. So we'd love to, to jump in and, and support you guys. Um, in, in this. So Kelly, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. We love partnering with you guys. Yeah, can you help me thank Kelly for being here? Thank you. Well, as we continue our, our service today, uh, our lead pastor, Pastor Rob, is back from his sabbatical, and he is chomping at the bit to preach. Yeah. You know, we've had we've had amazing guests the last two months, but I'm sure I echo what a lot of you are thinking and feeling. But we've we've missed him. We've missed uh, hearing from our lead pastor, and I know he's especially excited to to kick off this brand new series. Your religion is broken. God has placed this series, this message on his heart. So I'm excited for for you all, for our church, to hear what um, he has to say to help us get ready. Take a look at the screens. Welcome, Pastor Rob. Well, good morning to everyone that is here. Uh, I missed you guys. It's great to see you in person. And to our online community, thank you so much for for being here. Uh, when, When I was last here two months ago, we did not have a live feed for the service, and now there's actually a, a live feed, and there's an amazing group of volunteers, of owners who, who help us out with that. So this is a new team. Would you help me thank those that are, that are helping our online service happen? And uh, if this is your first time with us, I, I hope you love it. I hope you'll come back. Uh, take the Stick for Three Challenge. You can just scan that QR code. And I hope you'll invite someone to, to, come, back, to come back with you ne- next, next week. Um, I have been out, out of town. And um, one of the things that I've, I've actually uh, enjoyed about being out of town is that I could stay in contact with our, our church. And it was absolutely amazing on a Sunday when we were in all sorts of places all over America to be able to log on and to check out how things were, were going. And uh, if you, you're going to be on vacation at some point, so if you have not already, 
uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'll find Next Level 757 on YouTube, it will actually give you an update when we're live on a service. And you can follow along and join in, and uh, you won't have to skip a beat once you're, uh, once you're out of town or on vacation. Uh, today is also uh, September 11th, which uh, it's crazy to me that that was 21 years ago that that happened. And um, there's lots of emotions and lots of thoughts, especially for those of us that were around during that time. But one of the things that I keep thinking of, and I just woke up feeling this this morning, that uh, I'm incredibly grateful for the men and women that serve in our country, especially in our military armed forces. And uh, we have a, a huge military community here. Would you help me just thank our military? Yeah. We are incredibly thankful for, for you guys. And uh, one of our core values as a church is that you can't do life alone. And we really do believe that. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, if you want to uh, have some friends, if you want to get to know people, and if you just want to, to get closer to God, it will involve other people. And the way that we do that at Next Level is through small groups that we call Next Level Groups. And they meet for 14 weeks, same time, same place, every single week. And it's a chance to get to know others and to grow in your relationship with God. And uh, the menu for our groups, the different groups that we offer, it is live, and you can sign up. And if you'll scan that QR code, you'll see a little thing that says groups. And the reason I'm telling you about that is because once the groups fill up, we remove them off the menu. And so groups fill up incredibly fast. And we have all sorts of groups for this coming semester. Uh, there is a, a running group, and they actually asked me to join it. I told them I was praying about it. God said no, like quickly. God was like, that's not the group for you. Uh, but if you're into running, it's a, it's a great group. We have a, a group. I know a lot of people are really struggling financially. It's a tough time with our finances. And we have a group that is totally focused on how to honor God with your finances and have a system and plan. And so uh, that's going to be a great group. We have some groups that are Bible studies. We have some groups that are sermon-based curriculum, some hangout groups. So we have all sorts of groups. But once they fill up, they are full and uh, the groups close. So I want to ask you, if Next Level is your church, make sure that you... Uh, scan the QR code and look at our groups and sign up for one that fits your schedule. Well, today we are kicking off a brand new series entitled Your Religion is Broken. And our text is going to guide us through this. It comes from a parable of Jesus. And a parable is simply a story with a point. And the scriptures tell us that every time Jesus uh, talked to large crowds, he would use these parables. And we're going to see in this parable how, uh, how Jesus talks about the, the brokenness that comes with religion. But at next level, we want to honor the text because we believe that the scriptures, the Bible is the holy word of God. And so we want to honor that. And the way that we do that here is we stand to our feet and we read it nice and loud. So I want to invite you to stand to your feet and read with me our theme verse. It's Matthew 20. Verse 16. Now, before we read it, this is where it gets a little bit weird. We have a tradition here at Next Level. When we see the reference, which on this week it's Matthew 20, 16, there's two dots between the 20 and 16. We like to have a little bit of fun, and we just say dot, dot, and we pump our fists. It's a weird thing that we do. You don't have to do it, but all the cool people do. So if you want to do that with us, uh, we'll have a lot of fun. So read it with me nice and loud. It says, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Matthew 20, dot, dot, 16. Now that we've read the text, let's go to God in prayer. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray with me. God, we just come before you, and uh, we are in desperate need of you. We're not in need of just some inspiration or motivation. We're not in need of a TED Talk. We are in need of you. So we ask that you would soften our hearts and that you would speak to us, and you'd help us to do what you tell us to do. And God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page because it's kind of a bold statement to say your religion is broken. And there's some of you here, and when you hear your religion is broken, you get a little testy. You're like, you like kind of get defensive. You want to fight against it. You're like, there's nothing broken about it. In fact, when you saw the graphic that came up said your religion is broken, you probably thought your mom is broken. Like you wanted to like push back. Like that's like the ultimate comeback when I was in eighth grade. When someone would bust on you, you just throw it back on their mom. And that's how I'm picturing some of you right now. That you're like, it's not broken. Like, I'll show you, it's broken. Like, how dare you? And like, I get it though. Because um, when you love something and someone says it's broken, you get defensive. And so if that's you today, I, I want to ask you to reserve your judgment for the end of the sermon. Because I think that we're going to have a lot more in common than what you might think at first glance. 
But there's others of you here, and when you see that your religion is broken, you're like, yeah, it definitely is broken. And because you have experienced some hurt, and that hurt came from the church. Maybe the church didn't meet your needs. Maybe a pastor let you down. Maybe you were hurt by someone in the church you were gossiped about, or, or someone uh, hurt your feelings or talked about you, or there's a real pain or there's real hurt. Or some of you, maybe you have a, a, a tricky relationship with the church because you have a tricky relationship with God. And some of you, maybe you've been disappointed by God. I, I know one of uh, my, my relatives, he uh, would not call himself a Christian. He did not go to church. Um, to my knowledge, he did not pray often. But 10 plus years ago, his grandma was in the hospital. And he didn't want her to die. And so he prayed for maybe one of the first times in his life that God would not let his grandma die. Well, his grandma did die. And so because of that, he is now bitter at the church and he's bitter at God. And he doesn't want to have a relationship and he doesn't want to explore it because he's like, why should I go in if the one thing I've asked God for, I've never asked him for anything else. I just asked him to heal my grandma and he didn't do that. So I don't want anything to do with the church. I don't want anything to do with, with God. And so some of you, that's, that's where you're at. You've been hurt. You've been disappointed. Your expectations haven't been met. And if that's you today, I, I want to ask that you stick around, not just for this sermon series, but that you come back for the entire series, because I think that you're going to find a lot of hope in Jesus' words. Jesus often uh, pushed back against religious systems. Now, Jesus was an anti-religion. There's a lot of good that can come from religion, but the people that Jesus battled against the most, the people that Jesus pushed back against, the people that had the biggest problem with Jesus were the people that were the most religious, and so now we fast forward 2,000 years, and we have a whole religion based off Jesus. It's called Christianity, but it's not without its own faults and failures. In fact, it led Mark Twain to say, if Christ were here, there is one thing he would not be, a Christian. That's a pretty bold claim. I don't know how Mark Twain knows that. Like, he's been dead for a long time, but he wasn't here when Jesus was here. I don't know how he knows that claim. But when you start looking at Jesus' teachings, and you start looking at the amount of times he pushed back against the religious leaders, you say, well, there might be something here with this, with this quote. In order for us to all be on the same page, though, we need to define what is religion. Religion, according to the dictionary, is a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. So a religion is simply a group of people who have experienced God, and now that they've experienced Him, they've come up with a system in order to worship and follow that God. So every religion has its own system. And the system is, if you do these things, then you're in good with God. If you don't do these things, then you're not in with God. And so every religion has their own practices. Like, for example... I don't know if you're familiar with the Mormon religion. I wasn't really familiar with it. But when I had to study it in seminary, I learned that they do some things that I, I, I never knew about, that as a Christian, I've never experienced. Like the, the Mormons, they, if you're a good following Mormon, then you wear what is called the temple garment. I didn't know this. The temple garment is basically long underwear that has superpowers. Literally, that's what it is. And if you're a good Mormon, you wear it under your clothes all the time. It's believed that the temple garment will protect you from bullets. Seriously, that's what they believe. Now, if you're in the Mormon church, you're like, yeah, that's not weird at all. We all wear our temple garments. If you're outside of it, you're like, huh? That's a little odd. Every religion has its own practices. In the Jewish faith, there is a, a practice called kapara. And kapara is performed by grasping a live chicken by the shoulder blades and moving it around your head three times, symbolically transferring your sins to the chicken. Now, if you grew up in that faith and on a, on, on a church service, everyone has live chickens, you're like, this is just what we do. But can I just tell you that if I visit a church for the first time and everyone pulls out their chicken and starts waving it around, I'm out of there. I'm like, this isn't a cult. Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. But for those inside the faith, it's like, no, this is normal. These are the practices that we do. The Muslim faith, if you are a Muslim, you are to pray five times facing Mecca. So you don't just pray anyway. There's a specific system all religions have their systems. All of religions have, have their own ideas. Now, religion is not bad in itself, but there is a downside to religion. And the downside to religion is that it's based on your performance. Religion is based off how well you do in the system. If you follow the rules, then you're a good practicing religious person. But if you don't follow the rules, then you get 
in trouble. And the problem with it is, is whenever you have a religion, the focus becomes on yourself and your effort and not on the God that you're trying to worship. The downside to religion is because it's based on your performance, it always leads to two things. Number one, it leads to pride. When your religion is focused on your performance and you perform well, you start to become really judgmental of people that don't perform like you. And you'll see this in religions. They'll look down at other people and say, well, why can't you do what I do? And I, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to resist this sin. It's not that hard to do these things. Why don't you love God like I do? Because it's focused on your own effort, people that really get into religion can become prideful. But there's a second thing that comes with a lot of religion, and that is insecurity. You see, when religion is focused on your effort, on your works, you feel good about yourself when you do it, but when you don't do it, you start to become insecure. And there's certain things that you, you've said to yourself, I will never commit that sin. I would never go there. I would never act like those people. But then you find yourself committing that sin. You find yourself falling short. You find yourself messing up. And your brain starts to tell you, well, am I still allowed in? Like I said, I would never go there and I went there. I said I would never watch that and I watched it. I said I would never act like them and man, I acted like them. I didn't follow my own rules. I didn't follow the system. And now that I didn't, I'm questioning, can I still belong to that church? Can I still belong to that group of people? Can I still belong to God? God, if I didn't follow your rules, am, am I allowed in? If I messed up, if I broke some rules, like, like, am I still going to be accepted? Well, Jesus comes on the scene, and he constantly is pushing back against this idea of religion. And he's not saying religion is bad. He's just saying that your focus shouldn't be on you. Your focus shouldn't be on how good you do or, or how bad you do. Your focus should be on something else. And I want to show you this in the parable that Jesus gives us. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew starting at chapter 20, verses 1 through 2. And you can follow along. The scriptures will come up on the screen. But look at what, what Jesus says. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarii for the day and sent them into his vineyard. All right, a little bit of context here. Jesus starts telling a parable. There's a crowd around, and right away he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. And the landowner has a vineyard. Now, Jesus' audience would have been very familiar with this analogy. All of them would be like, oh, we've heard something similar to this. If you go to the Old Testament part of the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, we get this analogy, this idea that God owns a vineyard, and his people work the vineyard. And so his crowd would have been very familiar with this, and they'd say, oh yeah, we, we know this. God owns the vineyard, God represents the vineyard owner in this, and, and, and we're the workers. That all, that all makes a lot of sense. But then Jesus says that the vineyard owner, who represents who? God. The vineyard owner says, I'm going to find some workers and pay them a denarii. Denarii was the Roman uh, uh, money back in, in their day, and um, it, it was a good uh, earning. Like, uh, uh, like, no one would have batted an eye at this. No one would have said yeah, that, that you're being a cheapskate. Like, a Roman soldier got paid a denarii a day for serving in the Roman army. And so this is a fair wage. This is a good wage. And so Jesus tells this parable about the landowner, who is ultimately God, goes out and finds people to work his vineyard, and he's going to pay them a uh, denarii. Let's keep going and see what happens next. In Matthew 20, verses 3 through 5. About 9 in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. All right, so the vineyard owner, who represents God, decides to go back out at 9. And at 9 a.m., he finds people standing around, and he's like, why are you standing around? I'm going to give you some work. And he invites them in to come work. Now, if you don't know the context of the day and age that Jesus lived, you might look at this and say, why are these people lazy? Like, why are they just standing around? Well, in Jesus's day and age, if you did not have a full-time job, a job that you went to every single day, you would go to a big city, the largest city around, and you would wait at the gate of the city, and you would hope that someone would come to you and say, hey, I need people to work my fields. And you would wait around, and, and, and hopefully you would be picked. And most of the people would get picked early in the morning. It makes sense, right? If you have fields to work, you want to start right at 6 a.m., get this thing going. And so if you didn't get picked, and it's now 9 a.m., what are you going to do? 
Now, lazy people would actually go home and they'd say, I didn't get picked, so I'm just not going to work today. But these people that stuck around, they're not lazy. They just haven't been invited to work. They're, they're, they're waiting for someone. They're praying. They're saying, please send someone to invite us in to work. It, it reminds me of a story my, my friend told me when he first moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we were going to seminary in, in Texas, and he wasn't familiar with the area of Dallas, Fort Worth, and he owned an old, white, beat-up Ford, uh, tr- uh, like a truck, like a Ford, like an old Ford Bronco-type truck, and uh, he was driving this to, to class one day, and he stopped at a stoplight, and he's just sitting there at the stoplight, and the stoplight happened to be under an overpass, and he's just sitting there in his truck, and all of a sudden, his truck starts to shake, and he thinks to himself, is this an earthquake? Like, what is going on here? And he looks in his rearview mirror, and he sees five to six Hispanic men piling into the bed of his truck. And he's thinking, what is going on? And so he just yells, what are you doing? And they don't speak English, so they just sit there. And so then he sees more Hispanic men piled in his truck. And he says, at this point, there's 10 Hispanic men piled into the little bed of his truck. And so he gets out of his truck, and he's like, get out of my truck! And somehow they understood what he was saying, and so they all pile out of his truck. Well, come to find out, that spot in Fort Worth, Texas, was a place where construction companies would often go to find migrant workers. And the way that they would do that is they would pull a truck up, and then the first migrant workers that would get in would get to work for the whole rest of the day. So these migrant workers thought my friend's truck was just a job opportunity. They had no idea that it became a hostage situation. I tell you all that to say we have a very similar system to what was going on in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, there were people who needed work. They wanted to work. It's not that they were lazy. It's that they weren't asked. They didn't have the opportunity. And so the landowner comes out and finds them and says, hey, you you haven't found a job yet? Why don't you come work for me? And I'll pay you what is fair. Let's keep going in the text. Matthew 20, verses 5 through 7 says, he went out again. This is the landowner, the vineyard owner. He went in again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. So the vineyard owner needs people to work his field, and he just keeps going out. He keeps saying, he keeps inventing work for them to do. He keeps trying to go find people, and finally gets to 5 p.m. Now, 5 p.m. is the end of the workday. And in their culture, especially because they didn't have electricity, the workday ended when the sun started to go down. So they only had an hour left of work. And so, so the landowner goes out and finds some people that have been standing around all day looking for someone to hire them. And he says, come on, you can work with me. I only got an hour left, but come on, I'll, I'll hire you. Now, let's see what happens next, because this is where the religion comes in. In Matthew 20, verses 8 through 12, it says, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Let's stop there just for a second. So the landowner calls his foreman and says, hey, I want you to pay everyone now. But I want you to start with the people that I hired at 5 p.m. Pay them first. Let's keep reading. It says, the workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came and each received a denarii. So when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarii. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. So the landowner who owns the vineyard decides to pay everyone the same amount. The people he asked to come work at five, they get paid a denarii. But the people that were there at six in the morning, they also get paid a denarii. And when the people that were there at the beginning of the day, when they see that the people that came at five were only paid a denarii, they're like, that's not fair. They didn't earn it. It kind of reminds me of, of, of like... Um, the older generation in America. Like, have you ever heard people talk about, like, how today the problem in America is that everyone gets a trophy, and everyone's worried about everything being fair, and it's like, well, you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it. In my day, we walked to school uphill both ways in the snow. Even in July, it was snowing. And the, the older generation, they don't care about this fairness. They don't care about your feelings. They're like, you need to earn it. You want money? Work at it. You don't just get to show up at the end of the day at 5 o'clock and get paid. That seems right. That seems fair. 
But Jesus isn't giving us a parable on how to run your business. If Jesus was giving us a parable on how to run your business, this would be a horrible parable. I would say, don't listen to these words. But Jesus said that this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. This is a parable about God. And in God's kingdom, he goes to people, and he invites them to come in to his vineyard, and he invites them to work at it. And no one deserves the invite. They don't get invited because they're great. They don't get invited because they're perfect. They get invited despite the fact that they have faults and failures. And God, because he loves us, he's not satisfied with the few people that are working. He's constantly going out and trying to find new people. And he's walking out and he's like, hey, would you like to come work for me? Would you like to be a part of my kingdom? Would you like to be a part of what I'm doing? And he's constantly collecting new people to come to him. But if you're not careful... If you focus on the work being done, if you focus on the religion, you'll take your eyes off the owner of the vineyard and you'll start looking around and say, how come they get to come to church? Because those people, man, I've seen them on Facebook and man, they are, they are messed up people. And how come they get to come in and experience the goodness of God? And I can't believe so-and-so is here. They don't deserve it. They're not as good as I am. They don't love God like I do. See, the problem in, in this parable is that the people that were working took their eyes off what their eyes were supposed to be on, and that was the owner of the vineyard. When your eyes are on the owner of the vineyard, you have a very different perception. Look at what the owner of the vineyard says in Matthew 20, verses 13 through 16. He says, but he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarii? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And then here's our theme verse for the day. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So you track him with the parable here? The people that were grumbling, Jesus says, why are you grumbling? Why are you upset? Are you mad that I'm generous? Are you mad that I wanted to give them the same thing that I gave you? See, the problem is, is that when you're focused on a religion, it starts to make you focus on what you do. And when you're focused on what you do, it always leads to either pride or insecurity. And when religion becomes about us and our effort, we start to become really judgmental of other people who don't serve God like us. Or we become very insecure and we're like, well, I don't even know if I belong. But Jesus' challenge is not to focus on your work, not to focus on what you can do, but focus on the owner of the vineyard. Focus on God. Focus on Him. I, I, I read recently a quote from Kent Dobson. He said, from a symbolic point of view, those who feel entitled to work in the vineyard are the ones who refuse to dwell in the transformative power of God's mercy. See, the problem with religious people is that at times we just start to focus on ourselves and we forget that the point is to focus on God. And when you focus on God, it changes your perspective of how you see other people. Because you're not prideful anymore, you're not insecure anymore, you're focused on the goodness of God. And at the end of the workday, you just say, thanks be to God that you let me work. Thank you that you called me. Thank you that you keep calling other people. I just want other people to be called by you. I just want other people to experience your goodness. I want other people to experience your generosity. I want other people to experience you. I don't want to close doors. I don't want to not invite people. I want to invite people in to experience the goodness of the landowner. You can clap to that. <laughs> Pastor Matt Chandler says this, religion is usually the tool the self-righteous man uses to exalt himself. See, religion is often the tool that we use to feel better about ourselves. Well, I followed the rules. I did what I was supposed to. And practicing rituals, practicing religion, it can have a lot of benefits, but the downfall of it is that it always leads to pride and to insecurity. In fact, for many people, their only experience with Christianity is that Christianity is kind of like a country club. And if you're a part of a country club, you pay your dues. And as long as you pay your dues, you get the benefits of the country club. So there's a lot of people who think, well, if I pay my dues, if I go to church, if I read the Bible, if I give a little bit of money, then God owes me something. But then life happens, and they 
God doesn't answer their prayer the way they want him to, or they go through a difficulty, or they lose someone that they really love, and then they start to blame God, and they get upset at the church, and the problem is they're thinking about what they've done. God, I've done this for you, so now you are obligated to give me something. But that's what religion does. It's focused on our effort. Where Jesus said our focus should not be on what we do, but it should be on the owner of the vineyard. I saw um, just a a couple weeks ago this um, quote on, on Facebook, and someone was just sharing some insight, and I think it applies to what we're talking about today, so I wanted to share it with you. This person said, some of y all didn't try God. Y'all tried church. And when the church hurt you or found out that liars, fornicators, and fake people also go to church, you concluded that God ain't real or that Christianity is a joke. If people can make you walk away from God, you were never in a relationship. You were just in a religion. See, the problem with all religions is that it causes us to focus on ourselves. But the focus of Christianity is not on our effort. The focus of Christianity is on the effort of Jesus. You see, if it was just focused on our effort, then Jesus would have never died because the only perfect person ever to live is Jesus. And yet living a perfect life and following all the rules and doing everything that he was supposed to do, he still ended up dying on a cross. So when you go through difficulties, don't don't think, God, you're not pulling through. You're not doing your part. No, the God who started this whole thing called Christianity, he laid down his life for us. He died for us, and none of us deserve that. None of us deserve the goodness that comes from God. None of us deserve that sacrifice. So when you start thinking, well, it's not fair. I haven't gotten what I deserve. Start thinking about the landowner because it changes your perspective. If it weren't for God, I I would be so lost. I've sinned so much, but yet God has forgiven me. It changes your perspective. It changes the way that you see other people. You see, Jesus didn't give us a new religion. He gave us the gospel. Jesus didn't come to just scrap old religions and say, now gather around a new religion. He came to give us the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Well, I recently saw a, a great TikTok that summarizes the gospel in a very clear way form. And so um, I encourage you to take note of this. Check this out. What are the parameters to get into heaven? Just Perfection. simple. Perfection? Yes. So is there anybody in heaven right now? Yes. And they were perfect? No. Okay. I'm so, just answering your question. Okay. So yeah. the parameters to get into heaven are perfection. Correct. There are people in heaven. Yes, ma'am. But nobody's been perfect. Correct. How's that possible? Grace. Okay. All right, here's how it works. This is, this is the gospel in a nutshell. We are not good. Nobody does good. Nobody's perfect. We all fall short of God's standard. Okay. We all justly deserve his temporal and eternal punishment. We live under the wrath of God because he's holy, righteous, and just. And when we see somebody who's a violent mass murderer and we think that they should get what, what they got coming to them, that's exactly how God feels, but a whole lot more. Because he doesn't like lying or stealing or cheating or dishonoring parents, taking his name in vain. God is going to settle the score, and he's going to give everybody what they have earned for themselves. We've broken his laws. All we have earned is punishment. Okay. So. Okay. um, Well, let me me, me just indulge me just for 30 more seconds. Go ahead. All right. But God is rich in mercy. And he desires to save sinners, but he can't just forgive it and pretend those things didn't exist because then he would be unjust, and he's not. So his plan from eternity past was to send his son in human flesh to be a representative for you, to take the punishment you deserve, to take all of the righteous deeds that he did his entire life, credit them to your account if you will repent and put your trust in his son, he will forgive you because he makes you perfect okay. in Christ. The gospel. So the challenge for us today, whether you would consider yourself a religious person or not, the challenge is to take your eyes off of yourself 
Yeah, you got problems, but we all do. Yeah, you've messed up, but we all have. Take your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes on the owner of the vineyard who invites people who don't belong, who gives second chances, who doesn't ask us to work for him because we deserve it, but asks us to work with him despite the fact that none of us belong. Put your eyes on Jesus and it changes everything. This past week, the Queen of England died. And I didn't know so many Americans cared about the Queen until I got on Facebook. People really care about the Queen. And I ended up reading some Christians post about the Queen and it led to some really ugly discussions between Christians. There were some who were quoting some of the, the quotes from the Queen, talking about her faith in God and talking about her belief in Christianity. And there were other Christians who were saying, she's not a Christian because she's a part of the Catholic Church. And then they're arguing with each other and it became really ugly. And I'm reading this whole thing and I'm like, don't y'all know that people are watching you guys fight about this? You're fighting about whether the Queen of England, who none of us know, is in heaven or not. That's not our fight. That's religion's fight. Because religion cares about who followed the rules and, and who's in and who's out. But if you are a Christian, it's not about the religion. It's about the grace and goodness of God. So may we be a people that focuses on the owner of the vineyard. May we stop focusing on our efforts and how good or how bad we are. And may we focus on God. Because God's our motivation to do good. And God's our motivation to love other people. And God's our motivation to keep working even when it's hard. So may we be a people that constantly remembers the gospel. Will you pray with me, God? We come before you and we just ask that you would help us to remember your goodness and your sacrifice and what you did for us. None of us, none of us deserve the cross. None of us deserve forgiveness. None of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve to be invited to work into your fields, but you don't give us what we deserve. You give us grace. And so we ask God that you would help us, every one of us in the room, whether we consider ourselves religious or not, we ask that you would help us to put our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith that we would focus on you, focus on your goodness and what you've done. And we ask that you would change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we thank Pastor Rob for today's message? If you're here today and, and you don't have a, a relationship with the, the owner of the vineyard, if you haven't accepted God's offer of salvation, of, of grace, of, of a right relationship with him, and you, you want to take that step, you want to take him up on that offer, or you just have questions about what that means, what that looks like, there's something more that you want to, to, to hear about or learn about, we'd love to, to help you take that step or just answer any questions you may have. You can scan the QR code that's in the seat in front of you, next to you on the wall, on the screen, select the faith option, fill out a, a short form with your contact information, and someone from our staff will reach out and help you take that step, answer any questions that you may have. So be sure to do that. Don't leave today without, without taking that step. Or maybe you're here and you want to, to pray with somebody or have someone pray for you about something that you're, you're struggling with, something, there's a challenge or an issue in your life that you just want to, to pray about, or there's something good in your life that you want to celebrate in prayer. Thank God for that. Our prayer team will be available up front here after the service. They'll be wearing purple lanyards. You can make your way to the front after service and meet with them. They'd love to pray with you and for you about whatever is, is going on in your life. And if Next Level is your church and you want to invest financially in what God is doing, how he's using our church to advance his kingdom, to, to make a difference, to introduce more people to Jesus, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. You can place your gift in one of the black boxes that we have around the building, or you can scan that same QR code that we've been talking about, select the give option, and that'll take you to our online giving platform where you can give safely and securely. No matter how you choose to, to give, no matter how you choose to invest, just want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for prioritizing God. In, in this area of your life and, and helping us make a difference. You fuel the mission and um, what God has called us to do. So, so thank you for that. 
Well, thank you so much for, for being here this morning. Uh, Kelly from Echo is going to be out in our Make a Difference lobby. If you want to talk to her, have more questions about what they do um, or about foster care, adoptive care, whatever that looks like, feel free to stop by our Make a Difference lobby and interact with her. Um, have a great rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you back next week for, for week two if your religion is broken.